On this episode, I speak to Sarah Howard, landscape photographer and workshop leader and also published author. We talk about how she finds landscapes, how she works and much, much more. This is The Photography Junkie. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Photography Junkie. I'm your host Jay and every other week we get somebody onto the podcast to uh, interview about them and their work and also the aspects around the world as well. Now it's a bit of a milestone for me this week. It's episode 20. I've made it 20 episodes and uh, also it's a kind of a dual milestone as well because this week was the first week that somebody's actually reached out to ask if I would be interested in having them on the podcast. So for me, that's a, a bit of a, a personal goal. Um, and so I decided to, why not? Um, checked out the person in question's work and it's really great work. And I, I believe that she's going to have a, a story to tell us. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome onto the show Sarah Howard. Thank you, Jay. How are you today? I'm well, thanks. Yeah, yourself? Yeah, yeah, not too bad at all. Um, so it's uh, it's very much a, a sort of last minute thing in terms of uh, our arrangement. Sarah yeah. literally uh, emailed me yesterday and it just so happened that I was already sat at the computer at that very moment and um, I was looking through who I was going to interview for the next uh, interview session. So serendipity and all that stuff. Um, I, I decided to, to reply straight back to Sarah and, and get her straight on. So there's almost no preparation gone into this. Um, so I'm going to be learning about Sarah as at the same time as, as everyone else. So um, I hope you enjoy this uh, conversation. So um, Sarah, First of all, what made you reach out? Um, I came across the website yesterday, in all honesty. Um, I was just having a little look around um, different different uh, YouTube videos and had um, a look at some of the videos on your site. And yeah, I watched two and thought they were really, really interesting and just what a great idea it was. And I thought, yeah, you know, I could do this. So got you an email. It was as simple as that, really. So I, I actually love that sort of that attitude of, of I think that's a good idea, so I'm going to do it. And I highly encourage other people to do it. Um, I'm always going to check out people's work if they do email me. Uh, if you want to send me an email and you're watching this, uh, then by all means head over to the site. There's the contact details on there for you. And I checked out your work, Sarah, and it's really, really good work. And um, I noticed that you do things like the um, the actual uh, teaching of it as well, and, and you're predominantly a landscape photographer, is that right? Yes, yeah, I'm most definitely a landscape photographer, and I've, I've pretty much stuck to that, to be honest with you, right since day one. Um, never really diversified very much at all. And, you know, I get asked all the time, oh, do you not do wedding, pets, kids, you know? birds in flight, wildlife, etc, etc. And yeah, maybe I'm just really boring, but I just love my landscape so much that I've not really had any huge desire to, to divert from that. So uh, what actually got you into landscapes in the first place? I think partly it was definitely down to my dad. My dad was a really keen amateur photographer. So I sort of grew up with that around me. And uh, Especially, I think my love of the outdoor world was was also thanks to my my parents because um, when I was a kid, we used to go out on little trips all the time. We were always out, you know, exploring different places, traveling around just around the UK. And, uh, and Dad would take his photographs, and then we would we would sit at home and we'd watch them on there. Uh, we'd watch a slideshow actually back in those days so he'd uh, he set it all the equipment up and we'd sit there and watch all these slides that he'd taken at these various places and my mum would usually fall asleep in the process 
Um, <laughs> but I don't know, I guess it rubbed off on me. And so that's kind of where it started, my interest in photography, um, particularly in landscapes. And, and I suppose travel, travel photography as well, to some degree, because I love travelling. And uh, it was purely, it was purely an interest. It was a hobby, you know, for for many many years. And I, wa- I guess I got to the point where you know I wanted to take it further. I wanted it to be more than a hobby, but I didn't really know whether that was even possible to to make a living out of it. And I I remember looking at several picture uh, libraries online. I think Lonely Planet and things like that. And looking at the photos on those and thinking. Well, yeah, I reckon I could, I could do that. I could submit to these libraries, and actually, that's that's kind of where it started. Then started submitting images to picture libraries at that stage. So, I mean, we are going back now about twenty years, and maybe a bit more. Um, and uh, then I have to say, it was, it was very much um, a chance meeting with um, a well-known landscape photographer, Charlie Way, who really kind of got me going, so to speak, on the path to being a professional landscape photographer and I haven't really looked back since then. And how did uh, Charlie's, uh, would you say it's a, a mentorship even, how, yeah. how did that uh, mentorship shape your approach to photography? Very much that. Um, I'd always been a, a fan of Charlie Waite's work anyway, um, you know, for many years. I really liked his style and his approach. And I had loads of his books at home on my bookshelf. And uh, as I say, it was a bit of a chance meeting um, with with Charlie. And I I guess I really, I learned, almost learned everything from him. I mean, I knew how to take photographs before, of course, but I really developed my photography a lot more. With, under his guidance so I guess it was partly the way he approached a scene how we thought about it uh, his use of light the way he composed his images the way he really thought carefully about the construction of a, of a photograph and how everything kind of fitted together and that's really what I learned from him and to slow down, you know, to really take my time to get into it um, and to think about each and every aspect that goes into the to the making of a, of a landscape photograph. And so with the um, mentoring under, under Charlie, um, how much would you say that uh, his particular style of photography sort of rubbed off on you or were you able to maintain some sort of boundary in terms of your your own interpretation of a scene? I think his style did inevitably rub off on me. Um, I, you know, because I like, I very much liked his style. I wasn't, I've never tried to copy him, but it's funny because sometimes I, I look at photos I've taken and I think, yeah, there's, there's a bit of similarity there, and people have sometimes also said that to me as well. In fact, once I remember, I applied to uh, to be represented in a gallery and they refused me because they said my work was too similar. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but, you know, no. I, I mean, don't. I suppose you could call that a uh, quite a large compliment in some no, ways. It was a compliment, yeah, but it was also, you know, a, a massive disappointment as well. Um, but anyway... Yeah, so, you know, I've never tried to copy him, but I think, yes, I've been influenced by his style, undoubtedly. But I've never really thought of myself of having a style. And I know that sounds strange, and maybe I have got one, and I just can't recognise it myself in my own work. But, you know, whereas I can look at certain photographers, like Joe Cornish or David Noten, and and to me, they have a distinct style... When I look at my photographs, I don't see that. I don't ever see I've got a style. And sometimes I've, I've developed a real hang-up about this as well, you know, that I should have a dis- style. But whether I have or not, I don't know. See, as uh, as somebody that's um, viewed it for the first time uh, yesterday, 
Uh, there is definitely a style in there and one of the things that I did find interesting is you actually have a, a more sort of leaning towards more sort of muted colours rather than sort of bold in your face colours. Yeah. Do, do, where does that come from? Yeah, I think that's always been the way really. I, I'm, I'm very much concerned with representing the landscape as it is and not trying to overly kind of enhance it through post-production. So I don't really kind of massively boost my colours or, or anything like that. Um, you know, I like things to be as they were, as I saw them at the time. That's what I, that's really what I'm trying to recreate, really, that natural look. Um, and I've very much, I suppose, really shied away from from the kind of bold bold look that I know you do see in some landscape photography and again sometimes I thought maybe I shouldn't maybe I really should be beef beefing up the colours here but you know I've tried it and I don't like it and to me that's as I say it's not how it was at the time so I've tried to maintain that that natural look so the um often with uh with photographers we try and recreate the world as we see it and what I've what I've learned is sometimes it can come down to how you actually perceive the world. So I would imagine that in your general general daily life, bold colours and things like that may sort of be sort of almost overpowering for you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so to some degree. Um, I, I mean. As I say, it's not it's not something I've ever tried really to to do because when I do my post processing, which I have to say I keep to a minimal because it's not the side of photography I particularly enjoy. I do it because it's necessary. Um, you know, I, I'm quite conscious of not of not um, adding you know too much saturation, for example. And um, you know, I I tend to post process my images fairly quickly after I've been on a shoot so that I've got a really good memory of how it did look to me at the time. Um, yeah, and just, you know, recreate really what I saw. So I've never tried to never tried to overly enhance things. It's not it's not really what I want. And uh, is this your is this your sort of full time uh, thing now or do you supplement it with with other work what's the yeah no it's full-time now so I went full-time in gosh 2013 so yeah just 10 years ago really hard to believe it's that long um, time's flown but yeah so I, I run workshops as well and that really is the is the main part of my work um the workshops that I run here in the UK and also overseas. Um, but yes, I do make my living totally from photography, which is great. And um, well, how did the uh, how did the workshops start? The workshops well, they started really with me teaching friends initially, so not paid, just helping a few friends who wanted to learn more about their camera and get to grips with their photography a bit and then it developed again it was with, with the help of, of Charlie really from there who I mean he I remember distinctively him saying to me if you want to make a career of this you've got to teach you've got to run workshops and at the time that filled me with horror that idea because <laughs> Partly because years ago, I went to train as a teacher, teacher training college, and I lasted a year. <laughs> Admittedly, that was teaching children, so slightly different. However, it I was... I don't know, photographers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, it was just... I had that feeling of, oh, my God, I can't teach. You know, how can I teach? You know, I don't have the skills, I don't have the knowledge to be a teacher, etc. All these kind of self-doubt things, I suppose, crept in at the time. I didn't ever think I could do it. But that was really how I started, with very sort of um, 
casual um, teaching sessions with friends. And then then I uh, set up my, my business and that was actually in 2010. And I was, I was working full time at that point for a, a travel company that I set up my business alongside this. And I started to offer one-to-one tuition in my local area and, you know, did a few sessions. And it was just to test the waters, really. It was to see if I could do it and if they enjoyed it, you know. So from both sides, really, if if the clients got something from it, if they felt happy at the end of the day, and if I enjoyed it, if I felt I was capable of doing it as well. So that's how it started. And then it kind of grew from there. And and how do you how do you approach setting up your 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 workshops? Uh, do you have like a, a particular method? Um. Well, they take a lot of setting up. That's one thing I would say. A lot of research, a lot of planning and preparation goes into each and every workshop. No matter how many times I've been to a place and run a workshop there, I still put in a huge amount of effort before I go the next time to make sure that workshop is as good as the luck. So, yeah, it's the planning and preparation that's key, really. And, you know, all of the stuff that you do before the workshop itself, you do you do almost as much work before the workshop, if not more, funnily enough, than you do on the workshop. And with your with your workshops, do you tend to sort of revisit the same areas, or do you try to um, vary it in terms of the workshops? Or yeah, I try and vary it. So I'm always looking at new locations. Um, I will go to some of the same locations because they're tried and tested, you know. And I've been going for years, and I know they work. I know they're really good for groups, for example, that they offer good challenges, that the access is good, uh, you know, lots of opportunities. So I stick with those particular locations for those reasons. But then also I will always try and look out for new locations as well. Um, And, you know, you have to as well because of the weather. You never know what the weather's going to do. So you need to look for wet weather locations. and things to do when, you know, it's not such a great day out there. You know, where can you go in that kind of situation? So, yeah, I'm always looking for new places. And I usually go, when I'm going away to run a workshop, I normally go a few days in advance uh, because that's partly my opportunity to take photographs for myself. But also, you know, it gives me the opportunity to check out new locations and some of those might end up then being included in workshop. So, yeah, I try and try and do that because also it keeps it fresh for me because otherwise I'm going to get a bit bored too. You know, I've been running these now for 10 years and some of these places have been going back to for 10 years. So I've got to, I need to maintain my interest so that, that that enthusiasm comes across for the for the clients as well. So the um, as as you mentioned with the the weather, unforeseen things can happen on a on a workshop. Do you have yeah. a, any particular memories that jump to mind as to something that wasn't really a, expected at the time? Yes, most definitely. The one that stands out in my mind was I suppose it must have been. I don't know if it was two years ago or three years ago in in November, but we had a massive storm, Storm Arwen. And um, I was up in Northumberland. I just started running a workshop up there. I think the first day, first day we got through it was, it wasn't too bad. The storm was kind of on its way, but we knew what was coming. <laughs> so I, w- I was getting a little concerned. I remember we were, we were on Holy Island actually with the group and it was seriously windy. It's always windy. It was windy. And some of the locals came up and they said, you know, we think you should probably get off the island sooner rather than later, you, you know, because of the tide, um, you know, you have to obviously go with the tide anyway there and be off by a certain time across the causeway. 
but they were saying, yeah, you know, you're really going to have to go earlier because of the, of the wind and the conditions. And so, yeah, I heeded their advice and, and we left. And then the next that night, I think it really hit the storm. And the next morning, there was no electricity in the hotel where the clients were staying. Um, so I was staying elsewhere in a South Catering uh, cottage and managed to get to their hotel but had to divert because of all these fallen trees across the road. Um, we got to the hotel okay. And uh, then, yeah, no electricity. They were all sort of sat in this this lounge area around an open fire. So they were all toasty. Um, but of course, yeah, we couldn't go out. I mean, it was horrendous. It, it looked like a bomb had hit it outside the hotel. There were there were benches all over the place. There were trees down. Um, there were pub signs on the floor. I mean, it was it was awful, really awful, far too dangerous to go out. I mean, um, it sounds like a, a bit of a photo opportunity in itself. Yeah, I know. In some respects, yes, because you think, oh, yeah, there could be some great waves, you know. But you 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 know, you've really got to think about the safety of of the clients at this point. I mean, whereas, yeah, I might well have gone down to the beach to have a look at the, the huge waves. It, it's a little bit different when you've got a group of people and you've really got to think about that side of things. And you've got trees falling down all over the place. I mean, it's not it's not ideal. It's not something you want to risk. Um, so, yeah, I remember we, we, we were a bit stuck because the hotel had no electricity and I was planning on doing some indoor work with them, some image critique, some light room trip and things like that. But of course, there was no power. And luckily, one of the, the clients was staying in a and b up the road and they had their own generator. So that was great. So we all headed up to there, sat around and managed to do some work for, you know, a good part of the day indoors. Um, and then the problem arose in the evening because we would normally go for a pub meal. But, of course, the pubs were all shut because they had no power. <laughs> and the shops weren't open really neither because they had no power to operate their tills. So I was thinking, right, OK, what are we going to do for food this evening? <laughs> um, so I, I went out with my, my husband, who was with me at the time, and we went out hunting to see what was open. And... Uh, we managed to find uh, services down the road, on the main road, who were serving food and, uh, you know, things, bacon sandwiches and things like this. So we went back and I said to the group, well, look, it's it's kind of a bacon sandwich or some chips or nothing. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, no, that's fine. That suits us, no problem. So we all trooped off to this services for our evening meal. We sat there with our bacon butters and our little mini bottles of red wine and stuff. <laughs> I, I suppose in that situation, um, at, at least I would myself, you kind of accept things the way they are. Did, did anyone sort of come back and complain about it? Or No, not at all. I mean, they were very good. I mean, I was a bit concerned, obviously, but, you know, there's nothing I could do. It was completely out of my control and... Um, I think they fully appreciated that and they were quite yeah they were quite happy really with with everything that that I did try to do on their behalf um I mean it, it was quite funny really it was just a shame because obviously we didn't get the full you know it's a three-day workshop we didn't really get the full three days worth of photography but the next morning um things had calmed down a little bit and we did actually manage to get out, and it was pretty windy, but we got out and we did we did some photography. So we we lost one day really. That was it out of that weekend, but it was definitely definitely an experience, not one I wish to repeat. The worst one I've had, but not bad for ten years. So with um with landscape photography, I, I suppose it just kind of comes with part of the territory that you're going to get your bad weather days. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think you've really got to be prepared for that and, and have that in your head that the weather may not be great all the time. And I do say this to people, you know, if, if you're going to do, do a workshop in somewhere like the Lake District or Scotland, actually you need to expect bad weather. 
you may not get it. <laughs> you might be really lucky. It might be great. But at the other, on the other side of the coin, um, you can get great pictures in bad weather. Obviously, not in a gale, or necessarily, or you know, when it's she can run it down with rain. But you can get fabulous dark skies. You get masses of mood and atmosphere. You can get moments of brilliant light, and so you can come out of of that experience with some fabulous pictures that you wouldn't have got otherwise because there's a high chance that if you were at home and the weather was rubbish outside you're not going to go out you're going to look out the window and you think no not today but if you're there with a group of people and you're you paid to be on a workshop you're going to go <laughs> um so actually i tend to find it pays off so do you have uh, any any tips for anybody that's um that's looking to basically protect their gear um in in the, in the elements um yeah i think you you need to have a rain cover for your camera even if it is only something really basic like a shower you know, or whether it's a plastic bag with a hole cut in the end it, it doesn't need to be one of these highly expensive um and moraine covers. In fact, sometimes they're so complicated you can't even work out how to put it on the camera. Um, so, you know, something cheap and cheerful um, that will just keep your camera dry. Um, and things like a lens hood can help as well. Just keep a bit of the rain off the front of the lens. Um, yeah, always make sure you've got plenty of lens cloths with you so you can keep uh, wiping the lens. Um, and you know not all cameras are weatherproof I mean that's the other thing to bear in mind so you do need to have these rain covers um, and then of course for the camera bag as well you know have a waterproof cover for the bag um, have, have, a, have something to put your camera bag on so if you're going to put it down on the floor you know rather than put it in a puddle have a plastic sheet to put it on so these kind of just small things can make life easier and actually make all the difference. And and of course, having you know the right gear for you, the photographer, making sure you've got good waterproof, so you're warm, all these sorts of things. It, it makes it much easier. So you're not you're not sort of fighting the elements so much. Have you ever had it on a uh, on a workshop that either you or one of your clients has uh, has uh, lost their uh, their make their camera due to the uh, to the elements. Mm, not due to the well, no, not exactly. I've had two or three people physically drop cameras in the water. Um, that's that's happened a few times, um, or drop their camera, you know, on on a beach or something, and it's hit a rock, something like that. So there's been a few of those, but not not all that many, in all honesty. Um, but yeah, and um, you know, Pete, I, I always say to everybody, you know, when you're on a beach, you know, when you've finished in one location, I know it's a bit of a pain, but put all of the stuff back in the bag and then walk to the next spot and then set it up again. Because... You know, a lot of people, they won't, they do that. And they just have their cameras sort of hanging off their tripod and they're walking across these slippery rocks and it is an accident waiting to happen. <laughs> and you've got seriously expensive gear on the end of that tripod. But, I, I, I think uh, I would, I learned the hard way one year and lost a uh, 70 to 200. Um, well, it, I say lost, it went into two parts. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, wasn't it wasn't the greatest of uh, learning lessons, but it definitely was a learning lesson. Yeah, um, happens to the best of us, doesn't it? I mean, I've dropped filters in the river numerous times, and but yeah, part of the course. What would you say is your your worst sort of mess up that you've done yourself? Um, I've been. Fairly lucky, I think. Most of the time, it's only been a case of broken filters. So I remember once I put my camera up on my tripod and I think 
hadn't quite got it level or something. I can't quite remember now. But anyway, um, it toppled forward and the um, one of the filters literally came off the camera um, and rolled into the river in front of me. And it was, it was almost like slow motion. The camera was okay. I caught the camera. Um, but yeah, I watched this filter sort of roll away from me and it was an expensive polarizing filter as well. Uh, so that wasn't too great. Um, but no, otherwise I've been fairly lucky with, with things like that. I haven't had any major accidents. And uh, speaking of gear, I don't sort of dive too deeply into it, but what is your, your current sort of go-to? Uh, well, now I'm using a Nikon Z7 II, so I switched to mirrorless, I suppose, a year and a half ago, maybe. Maybe it's a bit longer. Um, and I've always used Nikon pretty much from day one. Um, for a short time, I had a Canon going back years and years ago. That got stolen, unfortunately. Um, but no, I've always used Nikon because, I, I, I don't know, it just works for me. And I think you get used to a certain system, you know, where everything is in the menu. You get used to the way the controls work. And if it suits you, you know, unless there's a great reason to switch, then I don't really see, I don't really see a need to do that. And, and so uh, do, you, do you find that the... Uh the actual mirrorless aspect of it um, has uh, pushed your photography forwards or have you noticed any difference at all? Um, the only thing I would say is it's not so much with the camera itself, funnily enough, but since switching to mirrorless and, and obviously yeah, getting the, uh, the lenses as well that go with the system, um, I, I was I was totally blown away with the quality of the lenses. Um, I, I actually borrowed a, a Z6 II of somebody before I purchased a 7 II. And I could not believe the quality of the lenses and how sharp they were. Um, you know, I mean, I had a good camera and decent lenses prior to this, but this was something else. And it was that actually that made me make the switch. It wasn't really the camera as such. I was pretty happy with my camera before. I mean, it's a little bit, you know, it weighs a bit less. That's that's a bonus, of course. Um, but but no, it, it's actually come down to the lenses more than anything. And uh, what sort of um, what's generally in your in your bag when you when you set off uh, for landscapes? I travel really light, I have to say. Um, I take the least amount possible. So I have a 14 to 30 millimeter lens and I use um, a 24 to 200. And those are my main two lenses that I would use with the Z7 II. Um, and that is really what I take with me I would say 90% of the time. Um, and my filters, of course, which I use a lot. But I don't take loads of extra lenses. I don't take, unless I think I'm really going to need a longer lens, for example. I wouldn't generally take that, though. Um, and I wouldn't take an extra body with me, even though I've still got my old Nikon. I, I don't actually take it with me much anymore. So I, my equipment is pretty kind of minimalistic um, and my bag's quite small, really, compared to some of my clients. <laughs> and uh, how do you find the, uh, the battery life uh, when it comes to landscapes? Do you, have you, I, I know with the, because uh, I'm a Sony shooter and mm -hmm. originally before the, the newer batteries came out, I ended up getting into a technique of, of switching the camera off uh, basically if I, I wasn't ready to take the shot yeah. and and mirrorless while it has its uh, bonuses one of the big advantages of the original uh, DSLRs is that the, the battery life <laughs> yeah sure yeah I mean the batteries don't last anything like as long as they used to with my previous camera 
Um, but, you know, I take plenty of batteries with me. I mean, they're not bad. I still am in that habit that you just said of turning the camera off until I kind of need it. Um, it's a habit that not really got out of at all. And I, I use the viewfinder quite a bit as well, whereas, you know, I'm not using the screen on the back so much. Um, but, yeah, uh, it, it's okay. It's not too bad. I mean, compared to some some camera systems that I've, you know, I've heard about and people have a lot of problem with the batteries and they have to take, you know, they get through sort of two or three batteries in a day. But generally I'll find, you know, one battery will last me a day. So that's that's okay. I'm happy with that. So you've uh, you've done workshops all over the place. Um, and even in other countries as well. Um, do you have any sort of favourite places? Yes, I do. I must admit, I do like Tuscany and uh, Italy in general, actually, but Tuscany in particular for, for its landscapes. And I, I've run quite a few workshops there now, probably for, no, maybe seven years. I've been running workshops out there. Um, I just love the, the softness, I suppose, of the landscapes, and it's got a kind of poetic beauty about it. And it's one of those places I find where there is a photograph wait, almost waiting for you around every corner, and you just you can't travel very far. You know, if you're in a car, you just keep stopping all the time because there's, there's something else to shoot all the time. And it's not just the landscapes, you know, it's the little villages and the hilltop towns as well. It's, it's really charming. Um, so that's one area I particularly love. But, you know, there's other places as well. I mean, Slovenia is stunning. Um, I'm off to the Dolomites in three weeks' time as well uh, for my first ever workshop there. So I'm really looking forward to that because the landscapes there are just, yeah, out of this world, really. I have a bit of a thing about mountains. Um, I, I I like uh, I do like my waterfalls. Yeah, do you? Yeah, yeah, I love waterfalls. <laughs> um, I find um, the lakes is very similar as well. In in that, regardless of what direction you turn, um, there's there's usually a picture there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that, I mean, as far as the UK goes, I think for me it is the Lake District. I mean, I've been up to Scotland. I've explored quite a bit of Scotland, and I do love Scotland um, for its drama. You know, and you know, I guess the mood of the place too, with the weather. Um, but you get that in the Lake District too, and I think I like the variety that the Lake District has. You know, it's got it's got its kind of harsh mountains, but it's also got a softer side too. It's got a prettiness to it. And it's got it's got variety as well that you don't always get in other areas. So it's interesting, I think, as a as a location. And you don't have to travel far really to to find things to photograph. Like with other areas, sometimes you do. You're travelling for forty minutes or so between locations. And uh, it's not just the workshops that you do as well, but you also do. You've also released uh, books as well, and um, your second book, the photographing the Cotswolds, um, part of the Photo View Guidebook series. Yeah. Um, could you give us a, a glimpse into the process of creating the uh, creating a photography guidebook and and how it differs from other photography projects? Yeah. Um, so it's not actually being published yet, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I think hopefully it will be later this year. So it's been a while coming now. Um, yeah, very, very different, I think. It was, it, it's been an interesting project. A lot of, a lot of work has gone into it, a lot of effort and research. And, you know, it, with the Cotswolds, it's, a, the Cotswolds is, is an area that's pretty, but it's not dramatic. So in some ways, it's harder to photograph than somewhere like the Lake District that has, that has got that drama about it. Um, it's very much about kind of pretty villages within the landscape environment. 
Um, so finding locations has been maybe a little bit harder than it would have been in perhaps another another place. Um, but yeah, the research side of things, you know, actually finding locations, revisiting them at different times of day to see, you know, what is the best time to shoot in this spot. Um, the practical things as well, like where would you park? You know, these things, how long is it going to take for you to walk from wherever you park to where you might photograph? And, um, you know, what has that area got to offer? Is it just like a one-shot location or are there, are there actually other things to explore there too? You know, what sort of lenses might you need in this location? Um, so all sorts of things that you start to think about um, when you're thinking about whether you include something in a book or not. Um, you don't necessarily want to put it in just because it's um, like a honey pot place or that lots of people visit. Because although lots of people might visit it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's that great to photograph. So that's the challenge I think I had initially. And and how do you go through that through that culling process for that? Um. Well. Literally, I mean, visiting a lot of places. Really, you, you've got to you've got to go through them and then see, think about right, what's this one got to offer, um, you know, versus another. And maybe it won't have as much, but is it still worth including because it's got one amazing viewpoint? Yeah, probably in that case it is. Um, you know, is there something very different about this place versus another? Um, if so, then yeah, it should probably be included. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, just kind of weighing up, I suppose, um, these different places and trying to put a bit of variety in there as well. And travel seems to be an integral part of your, your life. Uh, how does your love for um, travel influence your photography are there any travel experiences that significantly impacted your your work perspective as a photographer um, I don't know if they've really impacted it in that way but, but but travel is really my huge passion travel and photography you know I used to work in travel and I absolutely love it I love exploring whether it's here in the UK or whether it is overseas I just love finding new places and you know seeing what there is out there and then photographing them and I know I'm always I'm always looking for somewhere new the next place to go and you know that's what excites me and kind of yeah I guess keeps me keeps me going in a way but yeah there, there is no no particular place as I say it's there are certain areas I, I love, like Italy, for example. Um, but then there's there's plenty of other places I've been to as well that you know I would I would love to run workshops in going forward. Um, and I, I am always thinking about the next thing. You know, what can I do next? What can I offer my clients next? You know, what what's this place got that's different from something else? Do you actually give enough time for yourself for? actual personal projects and aside that you're going to sort of separate out from something that could potentially become a workshop yeah i try to i try to but it's sometimes that's a challenge um if i'm if i'm running workshops and i'll always go early then that's my time you know i might go three four days before and that's really my time then when i can really Kind of immerse myself in that area and, and I can photograph for me um, or I'll go away um, my husband and I we converted a camper van a couple of years ago in co during Covid and we love it and we've been out numerous times to different places and you know I, I photograph when we go when we go away with that yeah I mean I pretty much always got my camera with me um, whether it's just going away for a weekend, whatever it might be, I've always I've always got the camera. Um, and I'm always thinking about, oh, yeah, I'd like to go and photograph here or there or, or whatever. How much how much of that ends up becoming, yes, I'm going to bring a a, uh, a workshop here? Oh, 
quite a lot actually you know it doesn't in, it doesn't start out that way but yeah sometimes we'll go somewhere and it's not for photography you know and I'm I'm kind of right I'm not going for photography this weekend I'm just going to enjoy it whatever but I'll have a camera with me and then I'm and then I get there and I'm thinking oh yeah this is really cool and this would be great for a group and the, the cogs start turning you know and I think yeah and then there's this and this and I'm already stringing it together in my head and I can't stop it I can't stop myself and I get quite excited about the thought of that and the thought of sharing that location that area with other people um so yeah it happened a lot <laughs> And, and how do you go about uh, selecting a particular location to, to hold a workshop? Um, so I look at what the place has got to offer <clears throat> as a whole. So um, different, different locations, what, what they will give people in terms of challenges. So not just a series of pretty spots but a place where there may be some real challenges involved in terms of composition possibly, or whether it's going to require them to um, use filters, perhaps they can do some long exposure work. Um, I try and really mix up the, the type of locations on a workshop as well. So we, we might do, I mean, it depends where it is, of course, but we might do, you know, um, a little bit of woodland, a little bit of some shooting lake, a lake scene, some long exposure work, maybe some water or cascades, um, your bigger kind of panoramic views where they can try doing stitch panos. Um, so I really, I try and really get a variety of things in. Um, so it's not too samey, if possible. And also I find that you know, sometimes you go to a place and there's a great location, but actually it's only really good for one or two people. There's not enough space for anyone else, so that isn't going to work. It might be fabulous for you to go on your own, but not with a group of possibly, you know, six or eight people. Um, so there's that to bear in mind as well. And uh, you mentioned um, your belief in getting it right in camera rather than relying on post-production and mani manipulation. Yeah. Um, could you elaborate on your approach to capturing landscapes that, uh, to capturing la landscapes naturally and, and beautifully? What techniques do you use to achieve this? Um, slowing down and taking time is, is one of the main things. So when I get to a location, I really spend a bit of time, if it's somewhere new that I've never been to before, but I've gone to a specific spot, I really spend time kind of looking at it from all angles, um, working out in my head, right, what is it I like about this location? What's attracted me to it? Why am I drawn to it? You know, is it is it something about the, the, the beauty of it? Is it the feel of it? Um, you know, it, perhaps it might even be the light at the time. Um, so kind of figure that out first and look at it from all different angles, viewpoints. Um, I even take some shots with my phone um, initially, some quick shots with my phone to get an idea of compositions before I actually get set up with my tripod. Um, and then, yeah, I'll, I'll set up my tripod. I always use a tripod nearly... 99% of the time, I suppose. Um, and then I take a lot of care with composition. So I'm really, I'm really a bit fussy about the composition. <laughs> so, you know, the tiniest thing, I'm, I'm looking around the edges of the viewfinder. Um, you know, I'm really thinking carefully about how you place everything in the frame as well. Um, I do use the like, rule of thirds guidelines. For example, you know, I'm looking for leading lines, full band interest, the course, all this sort of thing. Um, and then I experiment with different focal lengths sometimes as well. Um, more recently, in fact, I've started to use my 
you know, to use longer focal lengths more with landscape photography. So there was a time where I would shoot really wide, like I would use the wide angle lens a lot. But now I'm almost starting to go the other way. I'm using a longer lens, so perhaps 200 millimeters, maybe up to 300 at a time, to kind of isolate a certain element of the landscape that, that I particularly like, as well as shoot the wider scene. Um, and, and do you ever um, allow for people in the image as well? Or, or do you sort of steer away from that if you can? Um, I'm getting better. So I used to totally avoid having anybody in my shot. It was like, no, wait till they've gone. You know, I don't want people in the shot. I just don't want it. And actually, most of my photos have got not a single soul in them. But occasionally there's been a time when perhaps there's been a person in the shot and it's really helped with that photograph. You know, it's helped add a, a sense of scale or perspective. Or it's really helped tell a story. That's the other thing I've found. You know, you've got you've got a big landscape scene and you've got like perhaps a bench in the foreground. Well, someone sat on that bench looking at the view, it just helps with the story. Or a guy walking off down a path with a dog, again, you know, it, it just helps in that way. So sometimes I include people, but most of the time I try not to. <laughs> And um, when you're in the uh, when you're in the field, uh, how do you go about uh, selecting that particular scene to, to photograph? Um, I guess. Well, as I say, I guess a lot of that is done when I when I take some initial shots with the phone. So I, I'm almost working out my composition by using my phone camera. Um, I'm, you know, I'm trying different formats as well. So I might try a square format. I might think, oh, okay, no, a 16 by 9 work, might work really well here, or perhaps I'll do a pano. Um, so that's where I'm kind of starting from, I'm getting my composition ideas from there and I'm taking it from there. And um, on your on your website, um... You mentioned that photography has changed your life and allowed you to truly see the the beauty around you. Can you describe a specific instance where your pers perspective on a landscape was transformed through the lens of your camera? Um. Oh, if there's a specific instance, but what I found as I was getting more and more into landscape photography. So when I kind of started out on the whole journey, I was paying a lot more attention to things like skies, clouds, different types of cloud, the light, you know, different types of light, the early morning light, um, the later afternoon light, evening light, twilight, you know, all these periods and the quality of light and how that influenced the landscape around me. And then, of course, the changing of the seasons you know, I became so much more aware of, okay, this flowers then, and then this changes then, and that, and now it's harvest time, and you know, etc. So I was, I was more aware of what was going on around me. I guess as my, as I got more and more into my photography, but there's been occasions when, you know, I've been at a beautiful location. One of them that actually does spring to mind was um, Bleetan in the Lake District, probably a year, maybe just over a year ago. I was there one day, I'd arrived, and it, it was dismal weather, actually, when I got there, which was frustrating because on the journey there, it was great, lovely light. And I got there and it was really dismal. Uh, I find the lakes does tend to have its own weather system. Oh, so frustrating, yeah. And I got there. And of course, then by then it was all cloudy and the sky was just kind of one white, one huge big white cloud. And uh, it was starting to drizzle. And I thought, oh, no, you know, I'm not going to get anything here. But, you know, I'd made the journey. So I wasn't going to just go straight away. I thought, well, I'll wait a while. Anyway, 45 minutes later, after waiting under an umbrella for the rain to pass um, and the wind to stop and etc., etc., there was there started to be a few breaks in the clouds and I could see 
you know, the clouds were moving quite quickly and I looked around and I could see these bright areas starting. I thought, um, you know, something's going to happen here. I've just got to wait a while, be patient. And, and that's what I did. And, you know, within probably the next 10 minutes, the place was transformed. It was incredible. The most amazing light just kind of swept through the landscape in front of me. Um, you know, lighting up the mountains, all the different elements. And it was quite fast moving light because of the clouds moving so quickly. So it was kind of, it was really exciting as well. And, you know, I was working really quickly to try and capture all these changes in the light conditions. Um, I remember that really, really well, um, because I suppose it was such a transformation from, you know, nothing um, to this incredible situation. So I guess the lesson is, you know, sometimes that you've just got to wait you've just got to be patient and wait for the light and it may not always happen you know sometimes you go to a place and you walk away and you haven't got a great shot and you know that but if unless you go you don't know do you you've got to try and um do you have any sort of future goals or aspirations as a landscape photographer are there any dream locations or projects you're hoping to explore in the in the coming years um I've got a few dream locations, yeah. Places I've been to, perhaps on holidays, that I've thought, yeah, this would be this would be great as a as a workshop location. I'd like to take people here and you know show them what it's got to offer. Um, there's there's one or two of those in mind, um, and I'm always looking for something new. I think I'd like to personally, on a you know on a personal note, I. I would like to do another book. So once the, the Cotswold book is, is published, I would like to do another another book. But I think it, it wouldn't be probably a guidebook. It would be um, probably the sort of book that is really hard to get published, like a coffee table book. <laughs> but, you know, I like writing. I really enjoy writing. Um, so I would love to do a book like that. And I would... I would like to have another exhibition because I haven't had an exhibition for years. So that's the goal that I would like to achieve. And um, we're coming towards the towards the end of it now. Um, do you have any sort of recommendations for people to check out, people that inspire you? Oh, gosh, well, um, I mean, people that inspire me, um, <clears throat> I do like David Norton's work. And his style of writing as well, so not just his photography. <clears throat> and then, of course, Charlie Waite. So, where can where can people find you when, if they want to check out your work? Um, so, I've got a couple of websites. I've got my own website, sarahhowardphotography.com, and then I've got my workshop website, which is separate from that, which is imagescene.co.uk. So, that's where I list all of the workshops primarily. So those uh, those links for people listening will be in the show notes. Uh, I'll link to both of those uh, so that people can uh, find you that way. Um, so that's basically it for the show now. Um, the All I can say is thank you for coming on. Uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. And uh, is there anything else that you'd like to leave anyone with? Or? Thanks, Jay. Um no, I would just like to say, you know, for any sort of aspiring photographers out there that really think, you know, they might want to make a, a go of this as, as a business, um, you know, stick with it because I never thought really that it would happen for me, and yet it did. And I wasn't, I wasn't um, a big kind of self promoter, if you like. I, I suppose I didn't really put myself out there as much as I could have done. Um, and I found when I started to run my own business, I had to learn so many new skills I had absolutely no idea about. But, you know, if I can do it, then anybody else can do it too. And I wasn't the most confident person either. You know, um, I absolutely hated giving camera club presentations at first. You know, it filled me with dread. I wasn't very good communicating to a group of people. 
So of course, you know, I got over that. Um, and I didn't think I could teach. So I got over that. So I would say, you know, if you really want something, you can make it happen. You can. So it's, yeah, stick with it. That's a, that's a great, to, great to hear. So I want to say, uh, again, thank you for being on the show. And uh, anybody that uh, is looking to uh, look into Sarah's work, uh, the links will all be in the show notes. There'll be a full uh, article over on the website for the episode. Uh, so that just leads me to say it's easy if you put the work in. This is The Photography Junkie.